deconstructing content offerings for the second screen. So just to give the quick definition, we're going to call the second screen a synchronized experience while you're watching TV. So uh, we'll leave out of it uh, other aspects of second screen apps for now. We'll leave out um, things like TV Guide and even my app next guide. We'll, we'll talk more about stuff that you do while you're watching TV with a phone or tablet in hand. And that'll be our primary discussion and we'll see where we go from there because I think with this group we may wander a little bit and hear some good stuff. Um, so I'm Jeremy Toman. I'm CEO of a company called Digit. We make an app called Next Guide. As I alluded to, it's a discovery app helping people discover what to watch on live TV as well as streaming services with some social services. Um, but it's really designed for the what am I going to watch on TV, not what am I doing while I'm watching TV. Uh, I've been at companies like Sling, Mediabolic, uh, I've worked with Boxy, Clicker, Voodoo, and a bunch of other companies in the TV space over the past 15 years. Um, but I'm even more overwhelmed by my amazing panel. I'll let them introduce themselves. Chuck, why don't you tell us sure. who you are? Uh, Chuck Parker. I'm the chairman of the Second Screen Society. So we're an industry body that was um, really put together to try and help progress this space um, with partners across the various um, ecosystem, I would say. Um, and, and spent a long time in this industry, specifically in LA and London, uh, in the media and entertainment technology industry with Technicolor, uh, working on things like this for some period of time. So. Great. Hi, I'm Stephen White. I'm the president of GraceNote. Uh, GraceNote is a software and services company, really powering digital media uh, solutions for consumer electronics manufacturers, application developers, service providers all over the world. Uh, we focus on both music and video solutions, and specifically in the second screen space, uh, we've both developed applications for uh, companies like ABC, NBC, um, as well as uh, developing platforms that can power uh, various solutions with recognition technologies and synchronization technologies. I'm Brandon Lucas. I run mobile for Black Entertainment Television. We're a Viacom uh, TV network. Uh, I've been heading up mobile there for about three and a half years, and uh, we've launched three co-viewing apps in the market now starting uh, in March of 2011, which feels like an eternity ago. <laughs> And uh, we've learned a lot along the way, so I'm looking forward to sharing some of my insights with you today. Great. So, uh, Chuck, I'm going to actually ask you to start off. You have a very well, you, you, you define second screen in a lot of very specific ways. I'd love to hear you give your um, quick version of how you, how you categorize the second screen world. Since you, sure. How many, and by the way, how many apps is it that you actually look at right now? Uh, it's well over 100, um, which is a, little, a lot of work. Um, but yeah, well over 100, and that's that's... I try to keep my purview onto the guys I think have a chance of making it. So there's obviously done more than that, ironically. Um, but it, but at least the way I look at the second screen world, um, I try to look at it through the consumer's eyes. So I think there's five feature sets that I focus on, sort of four reasons to pick up a, a device, but five feature sets, and I can explain it briefly. There's you know people who want to control their first screen, no big surprise, right? That's what the classic remote since 1950 has been around. Um, I, in my in my estimation, I, I usually call that simple, just because it's trying to make your life a little more simple. Um, the the concept of trying to find something on TV, and that usually comes into two different feature sets. One's around discovery, no big surprise, what's on, how do you tell me what's on. That that usually breaks down into search recommendation and and truly discovery that that lean back experience about finding out what's on. Um, that's usually coupled with. Uh, that universal search concept. How do I unearth content from more than just my current cable provider, et cetera, um, that I call seamless. And then we have uh, classically stimulating. So this is, yeah. um, it's going to go for sexy, but I think that would be even worse. Um, so so, so sti stimulating is uh, all of the stuff. And this, this is probably the newest use case that consumers are encountering right now beyond the social side, which is, you know, who's that actor? Uh, my favorite running back's current stats are, um, I'd like to buy that shirt. Um, tell me more about the plot, the trivia, what's the song in the background, all that kind of extra information that happens. Um, and, and different consumers want different experiences, right? Not everyone is a Sons of Anarchy fan or a football fan or whatever. Um, and the last one, clearly, is social. I think, you know, from my point of view, social is probably the most hyped in a marketplace. Um, whereas, you know, most consumers, surprisingly, uh, it's like the old click-through rates in, in the late 90s. 
it's less than one half of one percent of people actually make a social comment on Twitter or on on their app. Um, but about 50% are actually reading them, which is an interesting sort of point of view. But um, and, that, and so those five sort of areas is how I break down feature sets, and I think all the apps do one varying degree or another of, of those features. So. Great. And I'm going to keep the conversation what, what Chuck defined on the stimulating, maybe on the social side as well, mostly because I think on control and discovery, first of all, I don't think they're as interesting discussion topics, to be blunt, I think. We all kind of get that discovery is a hard problem, and a few companies are like ours will try to do stuff in there, and some will win, and some will lose. And same thing on the control side. But I think the stimulating side is where there's a tremendous, and social is where there's a tremendous amount of growth opportunity. Uh, and and so, uh, Brandon, I want to switch over to you. So you got a few apps out there. Tell us. Um, I'd love to hear an anecdote from your 1.0 or our app one. Um, you know, what was it? What were some of the, the, the major lessons learned there? And then how'd you apply that for, for your next product? Okay. Um, so I'm going to start way back about two and a half years ago when we first started thinking about doing an app. And we were already kind of late to market because a lot of other TV networks had brought an app, uh, had launched kind of typical TV show apps. And so we, we said to ourselves, we know we want to do something really different. We want to do something you know, that's going to kind of take your TV app to the next level. And this was really before... Like the word co-viewing didn't even exist yet. Um, there I don't weren't, even know if it does yet. <laughs> I don't know if GetGlue was around then. I mean, we really were kind of flying in the dark, but but we knew you know we knew a couple of things. The first thing we knew is that when people were watching TV, they were doing other things. They were checking their Facebook or their email or they were tweeting or whatever. Um, and then you know, and then the other thing is we knew there was an opportunity for us to make a show more meaningful by integrating an app into it. So, um, so we said, let's, you know, let's just really go there and let's try to figure out how we can create an app that's going to become a part of a TV show. And we spent a few days brainstorming, and ultimately we ended up focusing our first app around our live daily music countdown show. It's called 106 and Park, which is the BET version of TRL. Um, it's very successful for our network. It's been on the air for 12 years, actually. It's a two-hour live uh, music video countdown show. You count down the hits from 10 to 1, and then you have artists come on and they perform on stage. You know, you play games with the audience, et cetera. So um, what we ended up doing is we ended up integrating a few features that really come to life during the show. So one of them is whenever we have uh, a, a live amateur head-to-head -head competition, we used to have people vote by text message um, in order to determine the winner. But what we did is we turned it into a game in the app. So if you have the app open while you're watching those contestants, you can either flick this dial up and it goes ding, 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 or if you don't like them, you can flick it down and it goes eh. So they can, like, while they're watching them, they can, they can keep flicking this thing up or down, and the more flicks they do, like, the more votes they get for that artist. So we started seeing, just right off the bat, millions and millions of votes for people as opposed to, you know, maybe 100,000, 150,000 votes. People were getting really engaged because we made it fun. So that was one learning that we took to the next to the next step, and then another uh, you know another feature that um, Viacom actually has a patent in review right now for is it's called 106 Nation, and the way it works is that uh, during the live show the hosts walk up to this big map of the U.S. and uh, there's all these kind of glowing areas on the map, and those represent areas where the app users are logged on. And then they'll randomly zoom into a city, and as they zoom in, individual dots start to appear, and those represent the, you know, the, the actual app users. And then they tap on one of those dots, and their name pops up, and then they call them live over the air, like right then and there. And then they play a game with them, they let them talk to a celebrity, they give them concert tickets, et cetera. So the only way that you can get that phone call and show up on the map is if you actually have the app open during the show. And then you become a part of the show. So what was the, I'm just curious, most, simul, most uh, people in app during a show at any one time, are these stats that you've ever put out? Or? Um, yeah, so uh, the average viewership is between like four and 700,000 people. I'd say the max we had was probably about 100,000. That's great. Wow. So, um, That's amazing. Yeah, so you know, at, at its most compelling, we had pretty good, pretty good coverage. Um, you know, but we kind of try to take it a step beyond, let's just tell people about the artist, let's give them a link to the artist bio and really make it like, if you have the app open while you're watching the show, you can actually be famous. Or, you, you know, the more time you spend voting on uh, your favorite artist, the more likely they are to win. 
and while you're doing it, we're going to make it really fun for you. Cool. So, so that was like the that was like the key learning. And then you know, just to answer your question, when we did the BET Awards app, we gamified voting again. Um, but this time, you know, there's like this moving target, and there are these discs that you basically have to flick as fast as you can to that target. And the more goals you get, the faster it moves, so it gets like harder and harder. But um, the twist is that uh, we we accumulate, we tally up all your votes. So, you know, if you go through 10 rounds of voting and you get, on average, 15 votes per round, that's 150 votes. When you get the high score for your artist, your Twitter avatar and your handle actually show up on the board to everybody else who's voting for that artist. So all of a sudden now you're famous to hundreds of thousands of other app users. And what we found is that that really took it to the next level because people were trying to defend their, their high score position and really kind of preserve that fame opportunity. Cool. So um, I'm going to move on to a story from Stephen, and then we're going to get a bit more active. Just, uh, just one thing, I just want to summarize the, the takeaway I'm hearing from your, from your statement is, you know, one, worked great with live content, two, was tightly integrated to the content itself. In other words, it wasn't like some host was just told, hey, by the way, every now and then check a Twitter feed. It was right. actually, they, they, they had tools, and it was built into the script, effectively. Is that about right? That's right. Okay. It's ideal for a live show because you can have that real-time feedback loop between the app user and the show and actually let the app user guide the content of the show in real time. Cool. All right, Stephen, tell me about a movie you just saw. Yeah, so we, we've done a lot of various second screen projects, but one of the things I saw recently, which is very much in line uh, with what we were just talking about, is uh, a trial that Disney did here in L.A., uh, where they brought the second screen into a movie theater and uh, lit up the entire movie theater with people's iPads. And that's one of the first consumer trials like this that I've seen. Um, they did it with Tim Burton's uh, Nightmare Before Christmas, um, which is a, a movie that has a pretty big cult following. A lot of folks really you know, into the movie. Um, what they did that was really interesting is, yes, they gamified it, so the entire interaction with the movie was gamified into kind of five different types of games that they would uh, drop in at various points into the film. The thing that was probably the most interesting being in the theater environment is uh, they also created uh, content that was part of the movie, so the movie would stop at various times, the characters in the movie would start to interact with the crowd, and set up these games, and then as, as users were playing the games, they would, you know, at various points, light up various users' pads who were doing well, or light up various users' pads that weren't doing so well. Uh, and it was really interesting to see the combination of the second screen experience into a movie theater, which is traditionally not a social environment, and how lighting up these pads and gamifying the content created a very social environment in the theater. Uh, so it was a mixture of you know, adults and kids, or quite a few kids in the audience. Um, the, the adults and the kids both participated pretty heavily. Uh, I think the kids really, really enjoyed it. Uh, and it really, for, for me, brought home th this idea of what is the future of content here and how are we going to use the second screen as a participatory tool in that content experience, not as some ancillary device that's just used to shove a bit of content to and hopefully throw an ad at the user every now and again. Um, very, very interesting trial, I think, and, and you'll see more of these coming out from other studios in the near future. Cool. Um, so I'm going to postulate a, a bit of a theory, and I'm going to let you guys kind of hash it out a bit. So you know, I would make a statement that that well, as much as some of, some of these experiences, especially the ones you guys just described, sound really interactive and engaging and fun, as much as those that exist and will exist and will be fun and interactive, there is equal to, if not much more time when I'm watching TV that I, for the life of me, do not want to pull out the second screen. Um, am I an old fuddy-duddy? Do you think that in the you know, years to come, all content moves that way, some content moves that way, a tiny amount of content moves that way? Um, sort of some prognostications. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to go first on this one. We've, we've done uh, application projects now with multiple types of content. Uh, we did the early Grey's Anatomy applications. We did the Oprah application. We did the Weather Channel application. We're now doing stuff with NBC for Face Off. So we've, we've now delivered applications for various types of shows, and we've seen you know, a wide range of consumer feedback to interacting with a second screen around these various types of content. I think what we're finding is 
the drama, the Grey's Anatomy example, is a horrible place for a second screen. People are watching yeah. a storyline. They're immersed in a plot, and the last thing they want is to be distracted by a poll, a quiz, someone pushing related content to them that really they don't care about because what it does is takes away from that storyline, that plot that they're, they're immersed in, which for most people is, is an escape from you know, the everyday battering of digital content that we're getting all over the place. Um, reality TV, we know that the face-off application that we, we've done for NBC, working uh, with NBC, it's a reality show. You know, the, much like your example, users are given the opportunity to vote on which contestant they think has done the best job, and there's a lot of interactivity around it. That type of content yields itself very well and is, is ideal for this kind of second screen experience. Sports, I think, is also a, a kind of natural one in that there's a lot of very rich information that consumers tend to want about what's happening on the screen that you don't want to clutter up the main screen with. So it's another great example. Um, so for, you know, for us, I think the, the key is second screen solutions, which we tend to look at fairly monolithically, shouldn't be looked at that way. There's really different types of content, different types of experience that lend themselves better to different types of content. And I think it's also important to note that every user is not the same. You know, we've, we've looked at demographic breakdowns of the usage of these applications. And yes, the gamification stuff is much more attractive to a younger audience than an older audience. You know? So there, there's also segmentation within the demographic base of, of users that I think is important to look at as well. And, um, I would say, uh, I mean, I don't have much to add to Steven's example here, but you know, I'm, I'm just thinking about I was watching Homeland last night, you know, one of my favorite shows, and I never look at my computer or my phone when I'm watching that show because you have to pay such close attention. But you know, I was kind of thinking there's a whole backstory there, you know, about about the lead character and some of the secondary characters where you really don't know a lot about, you know, what led them up to this point. So I think maybe there's some opportunity there. Sure. Um, but it's not about, you know, for a drama like that, it's not about why you're watching the show. And we definitely feel that live TV is, I mean, it's a slam dunk for second screen viewing experiences. It's uh, it just really lends itself to that real-time interactivity, and you can create all kinds of live payoffs for people in the show. And that's a, you know, for our users, that's a big motivator. If they can become famous through an app, or if they can win a big prize or a lot of money or something like that, then those are all the things that are really going to motivate them to engage with it. Fame and fortune still sells. Any, uh, yeah. any dissenter? Uh, well, a couple comments, I, I guess. Maybe slight dissent. I, a couple things. One, I'd say... You know, 37 hours of TV, the mythical number of hours that the average American watches, supposedly. I don't know where they eat all the time, but um, th there can't be 37 hours of good content. I mean, no disrespect to the content creators in the room and in this town, but I, I think we'd be lucky to have a third of that as people really engage, whether it's a drama, a sport, whatever. My guess is two-thirds of that entertainment is background, almost to the point of boredom background, and they're ironing, they're doing something else, you know, they're... So, so I think second screen phenomenon, part of it's happening because consumers are quite bored and they actually have the opportunity to do something else that, that is easy to distract them, whether that is Angry Birds or an app related to the screen. When you get to that content where the, where the consumers engage, I, I, I do agree with, with Stephen a little, bit, a little bit, which is not only demographics, but different people like different shows for different reasons, right? Um, not everybody loves... Sons of Anarchy so much that they want to buy a $500 leather, leather jacket, right? Um, I can tell you when my wife is watching Gossip Girl, um, I, I have a whole lot less interest on what the characters are doing and what the subplot is. Um, but, but there are some things on the second screen that would interest me as a distraction, right? So there are, there are different use cases for the same people watching the same show. I, you can certainly see two people in the same room watching one show wanting different things out of that second screen experience. Um, and the last thing I would say is, you know, this, this, this experience is truly in its infancy. I was talking to somebody this week um, about a, a, an upcoming uh, cop show that one of the networks is, is putting on, and they're, they're building second screen into it up front. And what I mean by that is they're going to go through that classic, you know, drama piece, though, that where 
when the cop is doing something, looking at the evidence or the file or whatever, assuming you have a second screen, you'll be able to see what he or she is looking at directly, and it'll help draw people into the thing. That may be a bit more art than it is, um, uh, it may be a bit kitsch, let's say. But at the same time, I think you'll see more examples of the artist trying to draw the consumers in. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, the more they can engage you, the more their show can become popular, both from a, from a consumer level, people actually talking about it at the water cooler, and for their advertising, you know, which runs 90% of the industry. All right, so we covered uh, reality, sports, and dramas. I think it's safe to say sitcoms and dramas are very similar. Yep. I mean, yeah. All right. Um, well, we, we definitely, we, you know, we have some comedy, um, you know, a couple of comedies where we think it might lend itself to a second screen viewing experience because the, the content isn't so dense that you can't be distracted. But, you know, big, I think that that's... Big Bang Theory. I mean, I know everyone in this room is probably smarter than I am, but the number of times you want a good what the hell are they talking about trivia thing on your second screen just to find, you know, because it, it, those kind of comedies, I think there is a good reason. All right. All right? Um, you know, I, we didn't yeah. talk about it, but I don't think there's going to be, again, I don't think this is a big point of dissent. It's some uh, big live events, like the Oscars, presidential debates, I think those are fodder for this kind of stuff. Right. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, a topic that doesn't come up as often, uh, and, and Stephen, you were starting to talk about kids programming. And I know this isn't either of your specific wheelhouses, but... It seems to me that the next generation of the Blues Clues, Doras, etc., you know, my kids, to them, an iPad and a TV are indistinguishable to the point of they have touched the TV, expecting it to do stuff. Yeah, it happens all the time. Uh, so, <laughs> um, um, smear marks all over the place. But uh, it seems like the next generation of kids programming should have more interactivity. You know, some of the stuff that connect, that connect. Uh, uh, Sesame Street games are obviously a whole different yeah, level. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you, you look at like the Disney uh, properties, I think some, there's been you know really good usage of um, some of the capabilities that are there. There's a lot more that they can do. You know, The key there is the same key we're talking about with a lot of these other content types, which is creating compelling content with the second screen in mind so that that interactivity is part of the content, not some ancillary thought. Um, and that's engaging children that way. I think they're, they want to interact. Um, so giving them that opportunity to do so in a way that makes sense given the storyline, I think absolutely a slam dunk. Every now and then my kids just yell back at the TV. I have no idea what they're talking about. Um, what about, what about uh, Brandon, any thoughts? Uh, again, not your particular wheelhouse, but uh, educational programming, documentaries, history channel, military channel, et cetera. Uh, you know what, we do very few documentaries, but I think that, you know, if you're going to do a co-viewing app, it's got to be for a series that's got a pretty strong following because, you know, it's not cheap to do a really great co-viewing app. I mean, it can cost anywhere from low hundreds of thousands to, you know, a million dollars or more. But if you were to do, you know, if I were in charge of the next gen planet Earth, mm -hmm. there's no way I wouldn't have a second screen experience. Agreed. Right, yeah. like... You know, while the cool visuals, you see the maps of where they are and read the backstories or how they photograph. The I mean, there was one. How many people here watch Planet Earth? Do you guys remember the one where they had to get the, the snow leopard and the dude had to sit for like four months still and like on the last day when they were done with the shoot, like there was the snow leopard. <laughs> like that's a, that's a backstory that I mean that moment should be YouTubeable. I should be able to share that segment to someone. Sure. Um, I think that's, it's funny, it's not a sexy topic as documentaries, but I actually think it's, it's probably will, will have the most richness of experience because it's, there's so much more content than you can possibly fit in the shrunk down hour ver 44 minute version of whatever story was. Well, that's, and that's a very important point around that type of content and some other content types as well, some of the live stuff, for example. We, we tend to think of the second screen as this co-viewing simultaneous experience and it doesn't have to be I mean the, the whole idea that you can use it to capture things that later on after the show you're going you're gonna to want to look at dive deeper into in an interface in a way that's much more interactive and that you can actually dive you know dive deeply into sets of content we're starting to see folks broaden their vision around what this kind of interactive second screen concepts all about beyond just that hour segment because ultimately, if you can capture that consumer's attention for the next two hours after the show's over, well, you've, you've now extended your, your impact to that consumer into a three-hour window from a one-hour window. And for some of these shows, there's just a tremendous amount of, of deep 
you know, rich content that you can do that with. So, Stephen, what I'll say is that, that you know, if, if you're if you're engaging the viewer, you know, for hours after they're watching the show, and you can translate that into social activity, then that's really where you know, not only are you deepening the affinity with that viewer, which is going to you know, over the long term, probably drive ratings, maybe also drive you know, merchandising revenue impacts, but if you can socially activate them, then that's where it really becomes meaningful. Because sure. right now, what people do is, you know, they tweet during the show when they see a scene they liked, or at the end of a drama, they're like, "Oh, that was a really good show." But if you can take it deeper, and you're giving them a bunch of content experiences, you know, in the hours after after the show, and they're commenting on specific things that they're seeing and sharing that, then then it becomes a lot more meaningful. But what I will say is that for BET. We wouldn't do uh, an app around a TV show unless we had a few really exciting interactive hero features, um, you know. And and I, I think that's because we think that that's really what's going to motivate a lot of people to pick up the app and to use it, you know, around a show. And if it were just if it were purely just content, we would probably be more likely to go down the route of doing like a really good HTML5 experience. Okay. And the reason for that is because the economics are a lot more challenging sure. uh, when you do an app. Well, uh, I want to actually switch, uh, switch our topics a little bit, just go into a few other issues around the second screen space. So, uh, Brandon, I'm going to start with you, and then Chuck, maybe, maybe you can chime in. So you got the live show, and you've got all the, the app and the interaction. There's a problem that I've seen in a lot of the live co-viewing experiences, which is East Coast, West Coast. Um, does your experience work nationwide? It does work nationwide. I'm sure you've had some problems here. This would be, I think it's a great time. Anything you're comfortable sharing would be. Um, so we've got, you know, we, we've definitely learned things along the way. Uh, we actually, for our first app, we programmed an East Coast and a West Coast experience. So depending on which time zone you're in, you're going to see the voting experience open up at a different time. You're going to see, um, you know, certain pieces of content pop up, you know, at a time that's relevant to your time zone. So those are the two coasts that we do it for now. Now you also have, you know, the Midwest, you have mountain time. You've got Hawaii, uh, but, you know, probably about 70% of your viewers are on the East Coast and then another 20-some percent are on the West Coast. Um, so those are the two that, that you need to be more concerned about. Do you guys have any hurdles along? I mean, did you launch anything and then realize, like, oops, we forgot about the West Coast. Because, I mean, anything that's Twitter-based is just a train wreck when it comes to social and, and live, right? Because you can't, you can't solve that. Right. I, I mean, I, I was on the panel yesterday with a woman. She, not Gossip Girl, some other thing I can't imagine watching. Uh, whatever it was, she's, like, addicted to the show and the social and all that, but she literally shuts down Facebook and Twitter in her world yep. from the moment the East Coast version starts until she's done so watching it. Yeah. Right. Was that Gossip Girl also? All right. It's definitely a challenge. It's a big show, I guess. Yeah. I mean, just, you know, the BET Awards, our biggest show of the year, pulls in, you know, seven, eight million viewers. Uh, we, uh, you know, we shoot it live and broadcast it to the East Coast at 5 p.m. California time, but it doesn't actually broadcast out here until 8 p.m. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we've got, we've got one feature in the app where you, um, it's a kind of a fantasy game where you, you, um, Order, order the order that you think the performers will hit the stage. It's kind of like a drag and drop thing. It's really tactile. It's a lot of fun. So you lock it in, and then during the show, every, you know, the minute a performer hits a stage, you get a notification. So that's another one where you have to be really careful to do, you know, make sure you know if they're on the East Coast or the West Coast so you know when to fire those notifications off. Got it. Uh, if, they Chuck, if they watched on Twitter, they got all the answers. They got all the answers. But, but I mean, we lock it before it airs on the East Coast. Any uh, any hurdles or pitfalls you've seen in this in this side of things? Yeah, I, I imagine, I'd say a couple things. One, certainly the spoiler thing. I, I, I think, you know, in regards to social and and feeds, you know, some apps just do the live piece. And to your point, I don't know. If, I don't know if it's only twenty percent of the viewers of whatever program are on the West Coast, but certainly they aren't. It's a lot less than that of people who care about Twitter on the West Coast because of the spoilers, right? Um, you can't participate because it's already aired on the East Coast. Um, where you don't want to find out who's won, you know, the award or whatever. Um, there are a few apps out there that are trying to do, you know, trying to time the Twitter feed, a curated Twitter feed, in fact, around um, when the show starts. Um, you know, again, obviously, because to your point, Jeremy, those things get released out on Twitter. If you pick up Twitter, you can't solve that problem. But at least there's some avenue to try and have you participate in a... Do people use these, do you think? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, some of the apps yeah. make it 
by default. So when you mm -hmm. go in and, and you comment, right, if right. you comment on the West Coast, mm -hmm. then I go open the app, or I'm sorry, on the East Coast, I open the app on the West Coast, and I'll see your feed at mm -hmm. time code, you know, 22 right. minutes. Right. Um, and that allows you to aggregate audiences as if there's only one time code. Yeah. Again, how actively Twitter. Do you know how actively those are used? I think it's a really cool concept. I just wonder how effectively it translates into people using that and, and watching those I, comments that are time delayed and engaging. I would postulate if you aren't doing that in the next six months, they won't use your app. I, and I take that one step further. Really? I would say if you aren't going to do it, if you don't curate your Twitter feed, mm -hmm. And, and, I agree and find with that. a way to present, prevent spoilers. I think people will stop using your app. They'll use Twitter. But you're never going to stop Twitter. Mm -hmm. but, but the number mm -hmm. of consumers who complain about, I won't open up the app because I don't want to find out the end of the show, um, unless you point. happen to live on the East Coast, is going to be a big deal. So I, I, um, okay, I, so you're, you're, you're not saying in the sense of you got to capture Twitter because it's so important that other people see tweets. You're saying it's important for you to prevent people from seeing the wrong tweets. That's Correct. Right. Okay. All right. There, there there was was ruins. I thought you were right on that edge. No, you got, you got no, to have the no, 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 no. I, I think it's. It, I, I think it. While everyone thinks social is a holy grail, I actually think it can be the kiss of death if you right. don't implement it. And, and the last thing I would say about social, just while we're on that subject, is, you know, I think that pe apps take too much license with people's. Credentials. So you say, "Hey, I'll, I'll check in with Facebook for my account or Twitter for my account," and then I go tune into a show, and you immediately tell all my friends that I'm, I love your show and it's all my favorites and all this stuff. Which you know, I, I never even got a chance to say, "Hey, hold on a second. I don't really want everyone to know I'm watching Gossip Girl." By the way, um, <laughs> so then you stop using that app. So again, I, again, I think social, while everyone thinks it's the holy grail, can easily be the kiss of death if it's not managed correctly. I think that's fair. I think. You know, social, let's talk about social stuff for a second. So we can, we can assert a few statements. One is Twitter is not demographically representative. In other words, Twitter users do not represent, uh, Twitter actually so far we're still trying to figure out what users it does represent. Uh, the one thing we do know, there's a certain egocentric representation of a Twitter user. But there's not really a good demographic bias at this point. It's old, it's young, it's East Coast, West Coast, it's by, by and large lurkers. Uh, it is, and I will assert, and again, this is my first point, open for disagreement, that it does not represent mainstream audiences. I mean, for us, it, it does more than any other TV network. I mean, African Americans were really, really early adopters of Twitter, and we've got extremely high penetration. Would you say that tweets line up well to ratings of your shows? Can you look at the social pattern of the show and say, yep, that's about right for viewership? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we're always... when you look at the Trender, Bluefin, and Twitter themselves reports on top 20 shows, yeah, they, yeah. they aren't even close. Yeah. According to Twitter, um, we the always... top-ranked network is... Little yeah. liars. Yeah. But Little I mean, it, it also show. depends on how aggressive that show is about engaging their users on Twitter. So, you know, we've got, we've got a really big social media team at BET, sure. and we spent a lot of time and energy because we knew early on that that was going to be a big platform for us. So we consistently over-index and... Typically, when we do a live event, we're the number one show, you know, if not for that month, then, then for the quarter. Um, you know, so, so for us, it really is a, a pretty, you know, broadly adopted, it's a representative platform, but you really, you can't just kind of expect it to happen. There's a lot that we do to feed and water that machine every minute of every day. Okay. Stephen, are you, uh, uh, so to me, my biggest problem is you saw the recent Trender report was it Little Liars? Was it Pretty Little Liars? Pretty Little Liars was the number one show. Um, and CBS was the fourth ranked network. Anyone here know what CBS actually ranks as a network? Number one, right? Six of the top ten. <laughs> not everybody was here yesterday. Six of the top ten shows are on CBS, and not one of them ranks anywhere close on Twitter anywhere, right? So clearly we have some misalignment. And I appreciate that actually for that, that you're finding interesting stuff with it because that's, you know, I, I think. That, that's something you can build off. Um, Stephen, what do you, you know, are you you know I, I, I don't have a lot to say necessarily about Twitter specifically. I mean, I just think that, I think social has become a very large focus for a lot of these second screen initiatives and probably a little bit overblown in terms of its value to the average consumer. Um, you know, to your point about Twitter usage, I mean, you look at the Twitter user base, something like 80% never tweet, right? So. The, the participation in social for most folks isn't very social. So, you know, if you just well, want to read somebody else's uh, posts, that's... 
Let it's interesting. It's an interesting piece of content, but I think there's a way too much focus on social as it relates to second screen today. Quick question then. on your Disney uh, the, the night before Nightmare Before Christmas. Do, do, did everybody in the theater play? Did anyone just? You, sit in the you know, work? it's hard 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 to say because we were playing. Um, the movie didn't give you any and stats. I'll, and I'll tell you, the, the game the gamification elements for the movie were were a bit fast and furious. I mean, at the, at the, one of our comments back was too much. You okay. Know? Because um, we were all sweating and tired and <laughs> thumbs hurt, and you know we still lost uh, um, the game. But uh, you know they, it can be too much. But it it seemed like participation was pretty high, and you know that the gamification piece I think we've talked a little bit about. But you know it's a really interesting trend here as we're starting to see more folks focus on how do you engage the users and, and what type of interactivity is really meaningful. And gam gamification seems to be yeah. one that's very, very successful. You know, polls, quizzes, that kind of stuff, a little bit less so, but still for us, more interaction and usage of those types of elements than just, hey, I want to see what the what Jennifer's sweater is. Right. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna, if anyone in the audience has a burning question, I don't know. Great topic. <laughs> well, that's a whole yep. separate panel. You're here. What's the ROI? So, then, so, so for anyone who didn't hear, the question is, uh, boils down to where's the money? Um, and so right. for each of you, what are you seeing? You know. So first of all, money isn't isn't the only goal here. I mean, you know, the uh, a primary driver here is that we're trying to drive the brand of our network as being an innovator in the digital space, and that is something that's very valuable to us. Uh, we also are. So just on so, that point, do you look at it as a marketing spend? We look at it as a marketing vehicle, yes, in that aspect. So uh, we also set out to build these apps with the intent of driving ratings. Now, correlating digital activity with ratings is still, you know, the, the jury is still out. There isn't really a lot of science around it yet. Uh, but we feel that, you know, the accumulation of the things that we've done on the app front, uh, on, on, on the online front as well, and social media, is, you know, we're positive that, that it is contributing to ratings. Okay. Um, you know, do, it, you, it's, do you have, I mean, are there, so USA Network, they're pretty public with this. They're, they're hashtag killer game, which is kind of a second screen, semi-real time, interesting platform. Um, they, they saw a 12% uplift in ratings of the show Psych. Um, and that included back channel viewing. So they're calling that like a resounding success, um, which it seems like it would be. Do you have anything that we don't have that? We don't have that kind of okay. data yet. So um, you know, I mean, there are a lot of people trying to figure that part out. Um, are you? Are you doing? Sorry, I'm just in the interest of time. When you with with the live, what's it, what's it called? The live. Uh, sorry, the 106, kind of TRL. 106. 106 Nation. The 106 Nation. When, are you? Are people using the app? Are they able to download the music and buy through iTunes? Is there any add-on direct so, to, ma to money so stuff? We're talking about revenue. Yeah. Um, so th they're not able to do that in the app right now. But you know, in terms of monetization, um, what we try to do is we try to sell sponsorships against the app when we launch. That's always a big one. And then you have ongoing sponsorships for you know rich media, full screen interstitials, video pre roll, et cetera. But the thing that's really cool about our 106 and Park app is that we created this, we created a couple of on air experiences. So I talked about the, the heat map one. Uh, we've actually sold that to sponsors. And and then it becomes a broadcast execution. And when you can develop a new broadcast execution, then that's where the big dollars come. Uh, and then we also, another feature we have in the 106 and Park app is we have a barcode reader. So we, w we fly out these barcodes in the show and the users open up the app, they scan the barcode, and you know, somebody is going to win a new phone or an iPad or something like that. So, so that's another execution that we've been successful in selling a number of time to times to advertisers. And we actually, we didn't set out to do that. That was kind of a surprise to us. But that's actually been a pretty meaningful driver of revenue for us. So, so um, last one, I'm going to switch to you, Stephen. Uh, on the sponsorship in app, are, I'm not asking for any numbers or anything like that, but you know, when it's on TV, they can, they'll 
pricing is based on ratings. It's pretty straightforward. How does that model look on the app? Is it, is it based on users? Is it based on social engagements? When someone wants to sponsor, what do you charge against? It's usually a flat fee. Uh, yeah, exactly. So it's based on past experience, you know, limited past experience, uh, you know, based on number of downloads you've seen, total engagement you've seen in your other apps, um, projections around ratings and how that correlates to the ratings of whatever, whatever other app you've done. Um, usually it's a flat B okay. with uh, impression goals and no commitments. Fair enough. Steven, let's talk money. So, you know, we, we, I can't really speak to the monetization of the show part of the show because that's really up to the content providers. But one of the things that we've, we've really urged people to think hard about is if you're really doing this co-viewing kind of application during the ad spots, you know, what are you doing to leverage the, the platform for your advertisers? So, for example, we built an application... Uh, for Honda, for the Honda Fit that was done with, done with Wyden and Kennedy that used fingerprinting to enable the capture of characters and interactivity within the, the advertisement. The response rate for that advertisement was over 50% in the application. So you had 50% of users viewing that, that ad that actually interacted with it, which is just a huge rate for an advertiser. So I just urge you, if you're creating these types of applications, think about the interactive capabilities that that platform provides to the advertisers as well, and make sure that when you're figuring out what you're going to do with an advertiser, with a sponsor, that you're leveraging the technology the best you can to get a, 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 a rate here for sponsorship or a rate here from the advertiser that's optimized. And one, one thing there's, a, there's a, the early, early days here, right? So a lot of experimentation that can happen. Yeah, has to be. I mean, I mean, that's you know the challenge is that uh, you know you come up with all the concepts, creative concepts for the app at least a half a year before it comes to market. You start designing it, you start the build process, uh, and if you can land a sponsor early enough in that cycle, then you can actually really organically integrate them into like say a gamified voting experience in a really organic way, like making them a part of the assets that move around the screen. But oh. the challenge is always selling those early enough. Sure to be able to get them into that creative cycle. How long from now, uh, make a prediction, everybody, before uh, second screen inventory gets sold during upfronts? I'd say the next year. Next year. Next year? Absolutely. All right. Guaranteed. Uh, I, any other monetization thoughts? Yeah, I, I'm big provocative, especially if you work for a network. I would tell you that um, you know, back in 1997, 98, right, everybody said, who the hell is going to spend money in the advertising world on banner ads. It's never going to happen. They're never going to take money away from radio and print, right? You know, in addition to Google's AdSense and all those other things, the reason why money moved is simply because it's measurable, simply, right? Second screen is going to allow interactivity that's measurable. So either you're, whether you're a network who believes in it or not, a content creator who believes in it or not, I don't think it really matters. I think advertisers are going to make that decision, and maybe next year they put 0.0001% of their money into second screen. Maybe the next year it's half a percent. Ten years from now it's going to be 15 or 20 percent. It's a $200 billion global ad market, $120 billion in the U.S. So when, when BMW says things like, you know, I pay $30 CPMs for my ad, but I'll pay an extra 3 bucks if somebody actually participates in some kind of virtual test drive on my on my iPad or their iPad. And by the way, if you get into my showroom floor, I'll give you $100. That's that's serious money that's already in a chain somewhere. So it's not additional money. But if, if Network A gets there with that approach and Network B doesn't, guess what? Network B is going to be behind, certainly on where the ad money is spent, is my view. But that's just me. And you, you, are, you are seeing platform development and support of that. I mean, I think to your point, if you're taking an app-by-app -app approach here, it's really challenging to support this because you don't have a, a back-end platform that allows for the, this right. ad interactivity in a rapid enough time frame to be able to support it. So the, the back-end platforms here are hugely important, and you're seeing various levels of investment in those from, from various networks. Some very, very actively developing very robust back-end systems, some not. And, you know, I think the folks that are going to win are the folks that have that capability very developed pretty soon. Absolutely. All right, guys, we've hit our time. So thanks for being a great audience, and good job, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.